morning, everyone. Good morning. A happy Mother's Day to you all today. And thank you for joining us as we observe the last Sunday of Easter. We begin our worship today with hymn 501, Come Down, O Love Divine. May God bless our worship today. Unto the Lord, 
and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the Word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
shine far above all heavens. Leave us not without consolation, but send us the Spirit of truth, whom you promised from the Father. For you live and reign with him, the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. from Ezekiel chapter 36. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations, and gather you from all the countries, and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness. And from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart. And a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh. And give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you. And cause you to walk in my statutes. And be careful to obey my just decrees. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. And you shall be my people and I will be your God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from 1 Peter, chapter 4. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. As good stewards of God's very grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice, in so far as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you, that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. This is the Gospel of the Lord. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. The world around us will persecute the church. Not just physically persecute, not just the threat of death, but also a social persecution. They'll put us out of the synagogues. They'll put us out of the public places. This is a promise from Christ that as the church, we will face persecution from those outside the church. <clears throat> Why will they hate the church? They'll hate the church because of Christ. Because of the offense of the cross. Because the cross is offensive. Because what does the cross say about us? It says that we are not good enough. It says that according to what we have done, according to our works, we deserve death. That's why Jesus had to die. Because if he didn't die in your place, you would die. Eternal. You would suffer the pains of hell. That's what the cross says to the world. That we deserve death according to our sin, and yet there's a comfort to that cross, that Christ died on the cross in our place. Now, of course, our sinful flesh, our world, does not like to be told or implied that it is not enough, that it is somehow unrighteous. We are, as we know in and of ourselves, very self-righteous people. We're not naturally humble. <laughs> And it's only through the Holy Spirit, that spirit of truth, who proclaims to us God's word, that we see, oh my goodness, I am sinful. That I'm not righteous according to my own thoughts, words, and deeds. Now it's easy to repent generally, right? As we kind of did this morning, to generally say, yes, I am guilty of all sins. I have not loved God or my neighbor as myself, and so I am guilty, and for that God I am repentant, please forgive me. It's kind of easy to do that general repentance. But that's also kind of the general thing that a lot of the world says, that everyone is not perfect, but at least if they try, they're doing okay. Right? But that's not actually what real repentance looks like. It's not just the acknowledgement that nobody's perfect. Real repentance takes place on a very personal level. Let me give you an illustration of what real repentance looks like from my own life. So, I am married, and as those of us who are married know, it's sometimes you have an argument with your spouse. And sometimes you can be very bullheaded and stubborn for hours, if not days or weeks or even months sometimes. And then sometimes God's word comes to you, and it says specifically to me, God's word will say, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church who laid his life down for her. And I will realize, oh no, I have sinned. I have personally wronged my wife. I have not loved her as I should. And in that moment, I know, I look back on the last couple weeks where I have been very, very stubborn. And that kind of repentance, where then you go, where I go to my wife and say, Nicola, I'm sorry. I've wronged you. I've not loved you as I should. That's hard. In fact, that's impossible apart from the Holy Spirit. For two reasons. One, apart from the Holy Spirit, we don't acknowledge the truth of our sin, just how bad it is, just how much we have failed to live up to God's law, to love others as we should. And two, it's not possible because what's the result if I have to admit that I have really messed up? Well, I have to admit I deserve punishment. I have to admit, I don't deserve the things which I have. And apart from Christ, that is a scary place to be. Apart from Christ, admitting that you deserve death leads to death. That's why you have the world around us which is very self-righteous. 
They don't want to admit that they have messed up so badly that they deserve to be ostracized, that they deserve to be imprisoned. That's how we get things like cancel culture. Right? That's the natural result of acknowledging our sin. None of us deserve anything we have. And so apart from the Holy Spirit, admitting that I have actually sinned grievously is terrible. It means terrible things are going to happen to me. That I deserve terrible things. But with the Holy Spirit, with the Helper, that is the Paraclete, the Comforter, when I repent, I admit, yes, I have sinned, I deserve death. God doesn't look at me and say, yep, you're right, go and die. God looks at me and says, look at my son on the cross, who died for that sin. Who died for you. And that's why true repentance can only ever happen with the Holy Spirit. True repentance can only ever happen with the Holy Spirit. Because apart from the Holy Spirit, we do not have the truth of God's word, the truth of our sin, and we do not have the comfort which Christ crucified and risen gives to you. And so when we come in contact with God's word in our daily lives, we should repent. When we encounter something in God's Word which tells us, oh hey, you haven't been doing this the way you should be, you haven't been loving your neighbor the way you should, you haven't been living in your lives according to your vocations, that is as father, mother, husband, wife, son, daughter, worker, you haven't been doing that the way you should, and we see that from God's Word, our response should not be self-righteous indignation. <laughs> That shouldn't be our response. Our response should be repentance. And when our response is repentance and love, we actually live that life which Peter described in his epistle to us today. Where he said, above all things, keep loving one another earnestly. Since love covers a multitude of sins, Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. When we're living according to the life the Holy Spirit has given us, that is according to the love which Christ has shown us, we can stop being worried about our own self-righteousness Stop being worried about what we have to gain for ourselves and actually start loving our neighbor. Reaching out to them in love. Sacrificing our own needs on their behalf just as Christ did for us. That's what the repentant life of a Christian looks like. And what's going to be the result when the world sees this? Us loving each other instead of selfishly trying to go after our own gain? We're going to hate it. As Jesus says, the Spirit will bear witness about Christ, and we will also bear witness about Christ. That's not just verbally. We won't just tell the world about Christ. We bear witness about Christ with our own lives, and the world hates it. They can't stand it. Let me give you a, another kind of big example today, one that's relevant for today, being Mother's Day. Mother. Motherhood is an absolutely wonderful gift from God. In fact, motherhood is almost even, you could say, sacramental. That is, a sacrament is a mystery in which God creates life and shows his love, as he does here in the Lord's Supper, as he does through the proclamation of the word, as he does in baptism. And how does God choose to continue life in this world? Mother, He actually involves women personally and intimately in his creation. And we should extol that. We should hold that up on a pedestal. And a look at the world around us shows us they don't at all. Motherhood, at best, 
is kind of discouraged or disregarded in our world today. Really, our world throughout time. At worst, it's degraded and even despised. You have many people today that are declaring they're just never going to have children because, well, why would I want to put myself through that? Motherhood is a sacrifice. Anyone who's been a parent knows this. Motherhood is a sacrifice. It's a mental sacrifice. It's a physical sacrifice. It's a social sacrifice. It's a financial sacrifice. Any other type of sacrifice you can think of, motherhood is. But it's a godly sacrifice. It's actually putting somebody else before ourselves. Loving somebody as Christ has loved us. It's perfectly exemplified in motherhood. And the culture around us socially persecutes us, that socially pressures us to not like motherhood. To not encourage it. To not extol it. To not chase after it. The world around us would rather us raise our daughters so that they go after financial and uh, vocational success. Right? That our daughters wouldn't strive to be mothers. Right? Now I know this in my own life because I've seen this happen to where children by people in the church are kind of pushed down and cast aside. I remember a few years back my wife and I, before we were married, went to a conference at one of the seminaries, I won't say which one, and there was a professor talking about Genesis 2, right? That mandate that a, first, that a man should leave his father and mother and will fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, and then further than that, to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. To have children. The seminary professor, our own seminary professor, his response to that was, well, the world's kind of full. <laughs> One, that's actually not true. It's very untrue. Uh, two, how could you look at children and just kind of cast them aside? How could you look at motherhood and fatherhood and just cast it aside as if you don't need to do it anymore? The church has fallen victim to this pressure, to this persecution by the world around us. And for that, we do need to repent. The Missouri Synod itself has fallen into this. And for that, we do need to repent. And then I remember just a couple years after that, one of my first experiences, not in the ministry yet, but in seminary, I was at a rural church, actually, a lot like this one, and the, there was an argument about motherhood and raising our daughters to be mothers or not. And I remember this one father was arguing against the pastor and saying, well, what does the Bible have to say to my daughter who's going to go to New York after she turns 18 and uh, pursue a career there? What does the Bible have to say to her? And the pastor gave a response. was like, well, why, why are you sending your daughter to New York without the church? And, just on her own, that's, that's actually not good. That's not good for a son to go off on his own without the church. Right? And his response kind of was, his father's response, well, motherhood's really only, you know, a fallback. She's going to do more important things than motherhood, is kind of the, the sense that he was trying to get across. That's terrible. We should not have that mind among ourselves. And I was sitting there with my wife of less than one year carrying our first child, and this man just saying, well, motherhood doesn't really matter. My daughter's going to do more important things. And this sense has crept in among us. That motherhood isn't the most important thing that we can encourage our daughters to do. And on the flip side of that, fatherhood for our sons. We should encourage our sons to be fathers. It's the way that God sustains and continues not just the world, but the church. Again, the Missouri Senate itself has been guilty of falling into this persecution, falling into this pressure from the world around us, not holding firm to God's word, not supporting and encouraging motherhood in any way we possibly can. So let us repent. 
Let us repent. Let us flee back to Christ and the life he gives, to his word, which extols and holds up motherhood very highly. Is it is a wonderful thing. And let us as the church also support mothers. That's the number one reason given why women choose not to have children. They say, well, I can't support a child. I can't do it. That shouldn't be a reason that comes across their mind. We as the church should be saying, no, we're going to help you. And we should be active and vocal about it. Again, Christ sends his Holy Spirit to us to proclaim the truth. The truth that our God is a God of life, not of death. The truth that mothers really do matter a lot. And the truth of, cross, of Christ crucified and risen on our behalf. So that when we fall into sin, we can repent, turn back to Christ and his word, and say, no, I want that. And the Holy Spirit is active among us so that we can truly live as Peter extols us to live in his epistle. Again, loving one another earnestly. Showing hospitality to one another without grumbling. Using the gifts which we have been given to serve one another, not to serve ourselves. Being good stewards for the sake of each other. Let us do that with motherhood, with fatherhood. Let us do that in our lives with one another. Let us live in the love and the life which, which Christ has given us. Constantly coming back to his word to receive his mercy and his love. In Jesus' name. Amen. Please rise and